go back on the record, let the record reflect the counsel for the state, counsel for the defense, and the defendants are both all present. May I proceed, Your Honor? Go right ahead. Um, Mr. Lewinsky, one of the criticisms of the use of expert testimony in court is that no matter what the defendant does, they can often find an expert to testify for them. Some people claim to be experts who are not, uh, whose opinions are actually not based in science. Isn't that correct, sir? Objection, lack of foundation. I, I believe he can answer the question overall. I understand that some experts uh, can also testify based on training and experience. Um, yes, sir. Um, with enough resources, one side of an argument or an industry can create its go-to experts to defend its position. Isn't that right, sir? I've heard of that. I've not examined that. Oh, for example, the tobacco industry for years had experts come in and testify that smoking did not cause cancer. Were you aware of that, sir? Objection relevance. I'll You'll allow the question to be asked. I've heard of that. I've not examined that. Um, and those defending the use of tobacco uh, actually were, hot, were paid to do research for the tobacco industry. Were you aware of that, sir? Uh, yes, I think I was. And they never published their research anywhere but in tobacco-friendly publications. Were you aware of that, sir? No, no, I wasn't. Uh, we now know that smoking causes cancer. Is that right? It contributes to it, yes. And, and I believe the, it's general knowledge. And that research was bogus, was it not, sir? I, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't examined it. Okay. Do you think those experts in the tobacco cases were part of the problem rather than a part of the solution to smoking? Objection relevance to whether or not he thinks. Yeah, I, I think we're getting beyond it, so I'll sustain the objection. All right, Judge. Um, also, in darker periods of human history, there were people who called themselves scientists that claimed that physical s characteristics of certain human beings, say the size or shape of their cranium or their skin color, uh, reflected their inferiority and their tendency to commit crimes. Were you aware of that, sir? Objection, relevant. Uh, I'll allow the question to be asked. Yes, that's part of basic psychology. And that kind of science was used to justify the Holocaust and slavery, was it not, sir? Don't know that. that you, that's a relationship I, I don't know about. Uh, you weren't aware that, that the Nazis measured people's craniums to decide who was worthy to live and who was worthy to die? No, I, I did not. Um, you, sir, yourself have published an article in your Force Sciences Institute um, that talks about there being a firm foundation in science for a finding that men who have a short index finger compared to a long ring finger would have a higher potential for physical violence. Isn't that correct, sir? Uh, yes, there are two peer-reviewed studies in biological science that uh, indicate that. And you advised officers to look at their suspect's hands as this could be one of the indicators of violence. Isn't that right, sir? Uh, we considered that a throwaway line, kind of a bit of humor, because officers would not do that. That's not something they would normally do. In uh, that, fact, that's the first line of your article, is it not, sir? Uh, that's correct. That's correct. Our intent was not to indicate that as a strong uh, uh, suspect indicator. Are you training, still training people uh, in that to look at the hands to see if the ring finger is longer than the index finger as a, as a measure of violence, sir? We, we did not because that relates to athletes as well as to people who commit violence. It's connected to uh, indeterminate factors that have nothing to do with, real, uh, with whether or not behavior is criminal. It has to do with uh, uh, active action. Um, and you um, have not pulled this off your website, have you, sir? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. All right. Um, Matt Apuzo's article in the New York Times um, accuses you of being the kind of expert the tobacco industry created, does it not, sir? Um, uh, Matt Apuzo is incorrect, but he, uh, he, I think he says our, our, our science is not, he quotes people as saying, he actually quotes a plaintiff's attorney, who I don't know that they're a good source of, of science, but he quotes a plaintiff's attorney as saying that. Um, he, he, the article talks about how contrary to the law, you teach police to shoot first and you will come in and answer all questions later. Isn't that what the article says, sir? Uh, that's what a plaintiff's attorney named John Burton has said, yes. Um, and the New York Times article does quote researchers criticizing your methodology. 
um, and talks about how your research is based on YouTube-like videos of a limited number of suspects rather than scientific basis. Uh, it's Lisa Fournier. We know uh, basis or judgment on news lines and magazine articles. Um, well, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Okay. Um, you understand, uh, Mr. Lewinsky, that this kind of publicity uh, may destroy your credibility or the credibility of your business uh, that you've built since about the year 2000. Isn't that right, sir? It does affect our reputation among some people, yes. Uh, it might affect your credibility as an expert witness? Mm, depends upon whether or not people have the facts uh, versus the opinion of a plaintiff's attorney um, and someone who's opposed us. And you understand that this kind of expose might stop or de decrease police departments from hiring you to do training? It, it's certainly is a possibility. It doesn't seem to have, but it's a possibility. Um, well, it's just been a week, right? Uh, we're running ongo ongoing courses. We haven't had any change in registration to yes. date. Do you remember my question? It's, it's only been a week. Yes, sir. Um, and this kind of expose might stop uh, your four sciences group from training police investigators for officers involved, sh involved shootings. Uh, I doubt it. If the audience knows our, our research and the credibility of our research, they will not be affected by it. Well, that's your hope, isn't it right, sir? Um, no, well, that's our belief. There was a similar expose written by the Canadian Broadcasting Company. And I think you even mentioned it yesterday, didn't you? Uh, yes. Um, although you didn't talk to the court about the expose. Um, you were criticized after you were hired by Stan Lowe, the head of the British Columbia Criminal Complaints uh, Against Police Officers Division, to clear a constable who shot to death a mentally ill man. Is that right, sir? Uh, I did not clear him. I wrote a report. The Complaints Commission made a decision based on that. Your report said he shouldn't be charged. Is that right, sir? Uh, I don't believe I said he should not be charged. All right. Um, you said the police officer's shooting was justified, or constable's shooting was justified. Is that right? No. Um, you, the con that constable who shot a man, a mentally ill man who's named coincidentally happened to be Boyd. Isn't that right? I think it was. Um, although it was Paul Boyd rather than James Boyd in that case. May have been. Uh, and in that case, the constable shot the unarmed young man eight times while he crawled on his hands and knees. Isn't that correct? Uh, that was part of getting up and coming at the officer. He'd crawl and stand up and crawl and stand up, kept coming at the officer. Um, and he was a uh, animator, that young man? He, was, he did animation? That was his job? My understanding, he was. Um, you were brought in to tell the criminal courts that Constable Lee Chipperfield fired on an unarmed man by concluding, and here's a quote from your report, sir, the intense emotional reaction to the events coupled with a restricted focus had rendered him inattentionally blind. Isn't that what your report said, sir? Uh, that's correct. And unlike when you testify in secret grand juries that, that clear police officers, that testimony or the part, that part of your report became public, did it not? Actually, several reports of mine are, are made public. Okay. And there was a public outcry that the case be reopened, was there not? Uh, there were some people who claimed it should be, yes, yes. And your response to that was to criticize the Canadian reporter for doing a hatchet job on you. Is that right? Uh, not only did I criticize him, but the Police Complaints Commission criticized the influence that John Burton had in fueling information to the CBC. Uh, in fact, the reporting that you complained about was reviewed by a journalistic ombudsman after you complained and was found to be impeccable. Were you aware of that, sir? Uh, not impeccable. I said because they said one positive thing uh, about me, that that was fair and balanced. All right. Um, even though your business may be in jeopardy as a result of these two exposés, both the one in British Columbia uh, and the one in the New York Times, you're still required to tell the truth, aren't you? Objection. Assumes facts, not evidence that his business is in jeopardy. I'll allow the question a little. Sir, are you still required to tell the truth despite that? Uh, yes, I am. And if this court can't trust you to tell the truth on the stand yesterday in talking about your qualifications, it can't really trust the reliability of your research, can it? I would expect there'd be a relationship. All right. 
or anything else that you say for that matter, if you didn't tell the truth on the stand yesterday. Is that right? Correct. Um, you agree with me that everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but you are not entitled to make up facts, are you, Mr. Lewinsky? That's correct. Um, and in this regard, you understand that after the, the Supreme Court decision in Daubert versus Merrill Dow, and here in New Mexico, we've got a parallel case that's called Alberico, the judge is supposed to be the gatekeeper to keep out junk science. Is that right? That's my understanding. Um, let's start with our interview about 10 days ago. Um, at that time, we asked you very specifically how many times your testimony had been excluded or limited by any court, did we not? Uh, th that's correct. And you answered once, is that right? Fully eliminated once. And uh, you didn't add the word fully eliminated, you just said once, is that right? Uh, that's correct, but it was only eliminated once. And then we filed our brief to exclude you, citing the five other cases that we'd found where your testimony had been limited. And because that was in our brief, when you got on the stand yesterday, you told the court about all of those five cases, did you not? Yes, but I understand there's a difference between eliminated and limited. Yes, sir. And our question to you was whether you were excluded or limited in your testimony. That was our question to you at the time of our interview, Dr. And Hunter. I believed I answered I was eliminated once. Um, you know, we found yet another one that we didn't include on our list in the briefing for the court, and I'll ask you about that one, too. Um, you didn't own up to that one that we didn't know about from our brief yesterday, did you, sir? I don't know which one you're referring to. Okay, we'll get to that. Okay. Let's start with the one you talked to the court about yesterday, which was Gloria Miller versus the City of Los Angeles. It was a civil case. Um, Georgia Miller's husband was shot to death by police who never saw any weapon before they fired. Is that right, sir? That's correct. Um, and the court excluded your testimony entirely based on Federal Rule 401 and 702, which has a parallel a rule in the state of New Mexico, uh, and uh, the Daubert case because, and here's the quote from the order, it lacks the requisite scientific foundation. Is that right? Uh, that's my understanding. And did you tell the court yesterday that that decision to exclude you was appealed? Is that what you said yesterday, sir? I was informed by the counsel for LA that it was appealed and that they were granted the possibility of the judge having a hearing again on me. And they were then limited with the choice of one force expert. That's uh, what I was informed by the counsel from Los Angeles. And that's what you told the court yesterday, is that right? That's what I believe that to be true. You, that you would have been allowed to testify but for um, that they already had a force expert, is that right? Yes, there was another hearing that, uh, that would have uh, allowed us to appeal that. Right. Uh, you know, there's a thing in the federal system called PACER where you can pull up um, online uh, the cases that are on there. Were you aware I, of that, sir? I would believe that to be true. Yes, sir. And are, can you explain to me how there is no appeal anywhere of the order excluding your testimony? I, I don't know why that is. You'd have to talk to Los, Los Angeles Council about it. Okay. And uh, we did do exactly that, sir. We got a affidavit from John Burton, the fellow that you seem to think is your nemesis, um, who was the lawyer on the other side of that case. Is that right? No, not to my knowledge, John Burton was on the opposite side of the Miller case, okay. Los Angeles. I, I don't remember that to be true. All righty. Um, are you aware, uh, he says he was the attorney of record for the plaintiff in the lawsuit captioned Georgia Miller versus City of Los Angeles? I, I don't remember that. Um, and the issue of your being excluded was never appealed. That was never appealed. And, Your Honor, I'd like to uh, move and hand to opposing counsel the affidavit of Mr. Burton, who was the lawyer that we got last night, uh, who says that that issue was never appealed and nobody ever reversed the decision to exclude Mr. Lewinsky's testimony. This is marked as Exhibit 63, Judge. I gave them both a copy, Judge. Did I give you one? Oh, I gave it to Kevin. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Any objection? I join in that, Your Honor, as well as um, it, I don't know what the, the date of this. It looks like it was signed yesterday, August 6th. There's no, this is a sworn statement with no opportunity for us to ask any questions of this person to sign this affidavit. Um, and it's so far collateral, I don't think we should allow it to come in. 
Judge, I think it goes to 608B, my good faith foundation for six, my 608B inquiry into the fact that Mr. Lewinsky perjured himself yesterday before the court when he told you this had been appealed and reversed. It had not, but it never was appealed and reversed, and the order excluding his testimony stands in that particular case. Counsel, I'll admit it simply for the, the purpose of this hearing alone, the state's uh, motion challenging uh, the defendant to testify, or excuse me, the witness to testify as an expert. So it'll be uh, admitted for that purpose and that pur purpose alone. Uh, then one of the other cases where your testimony was limited was Sergio Lopez versus Chula Vista Police Department. Um, that was also in California, is that right? That's correct. Um, that was an excessive force case. That's correct. Where the court found that you were not qualified to give most of the opinions that you intended to offer there and only allowed you to testify about the speed with which a subject can draw a gun and fire. Is that right? Yes, the other elements were deemed to be uh, the mind of the officer, which they believed beyond my purview, which right. was correct. Uh, and then in, in uh, Two Bar versus Clift, um, that's where an officer shot into a passing car and hit one of the two unarmed passengers. Is that what happened in that case, sir? Uh, it's my understanding in Two Bar v. Clift. Uh, the court severely limited your testimony because many of your opinions were outside your purported area of expertise. Is that right? Uh, that dealt with an animation created by somebody else that I'd reviewed, and they said I could not address the animation issues because that's outside my area of expertise. All right. And in this particular case, the animation that was created, you didn't create that either, did you, sir? I didn't create the animation. It was based on some of the research that we've done, All right. which I validated, but they said I could not validate the animation. All right. Um, you've also, there's a, been an animation created here, is that right? Are you aware of that? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, you admit, as far as your area of expertise, that you have no training and are not a biochemical engineer, are you? Biomechanical engineer? Uh, correct. You have no physics training? Uh, I've had a course in physics, but no physics training per se. I'm uh, not a physicist. No training in human factors? Um, to the extent that human factors is comprised of some of the elements of psychology that I have studied, uh, that is not true, but I am not a human factors specialist. Uh, you have no training in kinesiology? Um, except for training from the Canadian Olympic uh, Committee, but no training in kinesiology per se as, as a university professor. No training in chronometry? Uh, measurement of time? Mm -hmm. Um, no, no, I've not received uh, training in measurement of time. No training in forensics? Um, I'm not a forensic specialist. I've had certainly a lot of experience in forensics, but I'm not a forensic specialist. You're not a ballistic specialist? Uh, that is true. You're not a specialist in firearms trajectory and analysis? That's true. Not an expert in homicide investigation? Uh, that's true. I've lectured to many uh, international associations about our research, but that's not, uh, not an expertise. That area of expertise is not mine. Never been a law enforcement officer? Uh, no. Trained in many academies, trained with many academies, trained for many academies, not been a licensed law enforcement officer. Okay. Never, uh, never uh, not an expert in homicide scene re reconstruction, are you? Um, certain elements of homicide reconstruction uh, is, are based on our research and are being used. Um, let's go to the case White versus, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Gerardot, is that how you pronounce it in Indiana, U.S. District Court? That's one of the ones you mentioned yesterday. That's a case where a Fort Wayne police officer shot an unarmed man named Derek Ford who had committed no crime after he followed the officer's commands to turn around and put his hands in the air. Isn't that what happened in that case, sir? I testified as human performance elements in that case, yes. But those were the facts of the case? Um, those were the facts of the case. And you testified on behalf of the police officer in that case? Uh, I testified about our research in the case. On behalf of the police officer? The police officer hired us, yes. Um, you created the same kind of reenactment you intend to use here, breaking the event into stages and estimating the time range for each stage, and the court would not allow that. Is that right, sir? Um, it, to the extent that it attempted to replicate what happened in the case, that was true, but to the extent our research was relevant, I could speak about our research 
uh, elements that were then considered by the court. Okay. Then in ADT Security Services versus Swenson, that was a, law, a civil suit against the ADT Security Company um, after a couple was killed as a result of a faulty security system. Is that what that case was about? Uh, it was alleged faulty uh, security system, yes. That must mean you were hired by ADT. That's correct. Okay. Um, the court was concerned that you were not qualified again to do a reenactment like the one that you're going to do, try to do here for the court and excluded that reenactment without a full evidentiary hearing. Is that right? Uh, I don't believe I'm intending to do a reenactment here. Um, and they did restrict, the, uh, restrict me in the reenactment I did upon uh, further review by the court. I believe I was to be interviewed and, uh, and then we'll have an examination on that. Then here's the one we found that you didn't mention yesterday. Humphrey versus Leatherman in the U.S. District Court in Oklahoma. Miss Humphrey's son was shot in the back eight times after a misdemeanor traffic sh stop and he was unarmed. I wasn't asked about that yesterday, but yes, uh, that is that's true. Yes, sir. W was there a list of things you were going over yesterday that you gave to Mr. Robles to ask you about? No, no, he generated that list. Okay, you seem to be looking at a something yesterday to refresh your recollection. Was what? I'm looking at documents provided by you to the court. Okay, can I see what it is that you were referring to yesterday? Oh, yes, so you were looking at the exhibits that we attached to our motion to exclude you? That's correct. Okay, and this is just, what is this here that you were looking at? That's my latest updated bio. Okay. Um, in the Humphrey versus Leatherman case, uh, again, the court limited your testimony to nothing but reaction time, to talk about reaction time. Is that right? Uh, I'm, there may have been movement time within there, but yeah, so it was action, reaction, elements of the case versus a reconstruction. Right. Would not let you do a reconstruction or walk through the case uh, like you want to try to do here. Is that right? Um, I don't think walkthrough is the appropriate term. They looked at the basic research and wanted to apply it themselves. Okay. Um, they would not allow you to give your opinion on the perceptions of the officers or inattentional blindness or the recreation that you had done. Is that right? Right. They stated that was state of mind of the officer and I could not testify about that and that's correct. Okay. Let's talk about what is science and what is not science. Uh, the name of your company is Force Sciences. For Science Institute. Okay, science, I'm sorry. Uh, and, you know, anybody can add the word science to the name of their company, can't they? I presume anybody can add any name they want to a company as long as it's uh, acceptable. Okay, the word alone doesn't mean you are engaged in science or are using scientific methodology, does it? Uh, it certainly doesn't. The name does not necessarily determine anything. Okay, you are not a medical doctor. Uh, correct. Um, and you're holding yourself out as an expert in the area of police psychology. Is that your area of expertise? I study areas of police psychology, yes. And do you call yourself in your publications and on your website a police psychologist? Well, I work in the area of police psychology and belong to a variety of police psychology associations. To the extent that action and reaction and perception uh, and human dynamics are part of psychology. That's the elements I study and work in. Okay, and you, you said yesterday, I think, that this area of police psychology is recognized by the American uh, Psychological Association, but the field of police psychology under the APA is for psychologists who provide counseling to police officers. Isn't that right, sir? Right, that's clinical psychology. Right, that's not what you do. I, I, that is correct. I do not do clinical psychology. And that's not what you did in Canada 35 years ago in the 80s, is it? Uh, no, I did counseling and therapy. Okay, you were a social worker in Canada, weren't you? Uh, no, I was not. Uh, you were a school teacher in Canada? I, I certainly uh, I was for one year in the 60s. Okay. They don't have any licensing of psychologists in Canada like they have here in the United States, do they? Uh, they certainly do at this point in time. That is, uh, they certainly do. Not back then? Uh, back then, if you worked under a licensed psychologist, uh, you were a psychologist. And you are not a licensed psychologist, are you? 
I certainly was a uh, psychologist at the time. I wasn't a licensed psychologist, but I was a psychologist within the agency I worked with him. Yes, sir. Right now, you are not a licensed psychologist, are you? Oh, no, no, not now. No, I've been a professor for 28 years. I've not been practicing psychology. You've never been a licensed psychologist anywhere in the United States, have you, sir? Oh, no. Cor uh, that is correct. I have not. And were you aware, and maybe you are because you have our, our motion, that it is illegal in the state of New Mexico to represent yourself as a psychologist if you are not licensed in another state? Uh, oh, I'll be glad to show him the statute, Judge. Well, I'll, I'll allow the question to be asked if he's aware of that particular statute. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that statute. Um, were you aware that it is a misdemeanor for anybody to represent themselves as a psychologist in the state of New Mexico? Uh, if they are not a licensed psychologist somewhere in the United States? I certainly do not call myself a psychologist practicing clinical psychology. Um, but you hold yourself out as a police psychologist? I work in the area of police psychology. Um, and, and that misdemeanor of holding yourself out as a psychologist when you're not a licensed psychologist is a more serious misdemeanor than illegal camping? Objection relevance sustained. All right. Uh, you haven't done any psychological testing of Officer Pettis, have you? Uh, no, it's not my area. And you haven't interviewed Officer Pettis, have you? Uh, uh, yes, I did. Okay, when, was, when did that interview take place? Several months ago. Okay. Um, do you have notes of your interview or a transcript of your interview? Uh, no, I don't. And why did you keep no notes or not make a transcript of your interview? Uh, I was primarily interested in his focus of attention at the time he pulled the trigger. Okay. And what he was doing at that time. Okay. And I can report back to you what he said. Oh, no, sir. I, I would not like you to do that because that would be okay. hearsay, sir. Um, let's talk about your PhD degree, which is from a non traditional university in Cincinnati called Union Institute and University. Is that right? Yes, it's an accredited uh, non traditional, but only non traditional for its flexibility. It was, uh, it's, it doesn't exist anymore, does it? Oh, it certainly does. Okay. Um, and uh, the way you phrased it yesterday was it gives classes across the country, I think is how you phrased it yesterday. Is that what you said? Right. It provides classes in a variety of locations. And what you mean by that is it, it's an online university. Uh, it has online courses, as does Arizona State University, but it also has uh, residence courses, and all of my courses were residential. Uh, you, uh, it has had, at the time, no psychological doctoral program accredited by the American Psychological Association. At the time, our students could, ex could take a program that was APA uh, qualified and currently has a program that's APA qualified or certified. And you did not take a program that was APA certified, did you, sir? Uh, no, I'm not interested in clinical psychology. You took a three and a half year program that you created and approved yourself. Isn't that right? Uh, to the extent that everyone can choose courses, electives, and majors, uh, yes, that is true. And most traditional PhD programs for psychology are five-year programs, isn't that right? Uh, without a master's degree, they tend to be, but I entered the program with four and a half years of, pardon me, f yeah, four and a half years of graduate coursework already. You were turned down for the PhD program at the University of Arizona, were you not? Only because the professor I wanted to work with had already had the graduate student he wanted to work with. He encouraged me to apply the next year because I would be his graduate assistant next year. That was Dr. Oscar Christensen. Yes, sir. You were turned down for the PhD program at the University of Arizona, weren't you? Uh, that is correct, and encouraged to reapply. Um, you never attended any classes on the campus of uh, the Cincinnati Union Institute and University, did you? Uh, not actually on the campus of Cincinnati, but I attended on all the other campus locations that they, they ran their courses on. Dr. Lisa Fournier, uh, that's the woman you were talking about yesterday. You're aware that she is the director of experimental training in the Department of Psychology at Washington State University? Yes, I'm very much aware of her position. She has a PhD and a postdoctorate degree from the University of Illinois. I understand that to be true. And she researches attention, memory, perception, and action. Uh, yes, I believe those are her areas. And she edits the American Journal of Psychology doesn't she? Um, she is not a main editor on that journal, but yes, she is one of the, um, it's not quite a guest editor position, but they do use her. And she is an editor of the Journal of Methodology and Experimental Psychology. Mm, I don't know that to be true. 
Um, she reviewed the dissertation that you wrote for your PhD program with Union Institute and University. The entire 112 page dissertation, did she not? My understanding is she did. Um, and came to the conclusion that it wouldn't have been sufficient to even pass an undergraduate class. Isn't that what she said in her affidavit after that review, sir? Uh, she also slandered me in a variety of other areas that were grossly inaccurate. Um, she claimed that your, meth your research methodology, even for your dissertation, was flawed, didn't she, sir? Uh, it was not a, the same type of research methodology she used. It's called phenomenological research design. It was approved by my graduate committee and uh, met the standards for a phenomenological research project. Okay, and let's talk about how Dr. Fournier came to review the information about you. She was hired by the U.S. Department of Justice and uh, later a private civil attorney to review your research, was she not? That's correct. And yesterday, did you testify to this court that Dr. Fournier only reviewed the summaries in the Force Science newsletter and did not, interview, did not review your full research? Uh, we were talking about the article which was later appeared, uh, w later published in the journal Psychological Science, the highest rated journal in psychology. She reviewed the Four Science News uh, and she looked at a, uh, a video by the Canadian Discovery Channel. Yes. So that certainly uh, is what she did in relation to that study. Yes, so you, you, it seemed to me left the impression with the court that she never looked at any of your actual studies, the full study, when you testified yesterday. That's not true, is it? I don't know that I completely explained all of the documents that she reviewed. Ah, so she, uh, you now say that she did review one of your entire studies. Is that right, sir? I commented that uh, in the earlier stages she had uh, not reviewed our attention study completely and had drawn conclusions, but at this point she finally had reviewed all of that study and did not include the criticisms that she had in her previous uh, critique of our work. So I'm glad she finished the attention study. In fact, sir, how do we know that she reviewed your entire study? Is that it was attached to the affidavit she filed in court, and that's indicated, if I can show you, sir, right here at the top of your full attention study uh, with the filing number for the federal district court. Yes, and that's how I knew she'd completely reviewed it and why I commented on it in court. Uh, but you didn't tell the court that yesterday, did you, sir? I did. I said it yesterday during my testimony. She'd finally reviewed all of one of our studies and thanks to doing that, uh, in the earlier version, her critique included stuff that was included at the end of the, the article if she'd actually read the whole article before criticizing it for what it did not include. And she'd finally read all of our study and now was on to other things, including whether or not we had used a um, comparison sample. Uh, which she did not use in any of the five studies that we reviewed of hers. So I was making direct reference to this study. Have you said everything you want to say on that, sir? Yes, thank okay. you. Now let me ask you my question. That attention study is the same attention study you're relying on here. Is that not right, sir? Uh, no, I don't believe I'm speaking about attention at all uh, here in relation to this study per se. Um, Dr. Fournier said that, that your um, research did not meet the ba most basic standards of scientific validity, didn't she, sir? Uh, because it missed what she said was included at the end of the article. She said you didn't do hypothesis, test, hypothesis testing? Uh, we believe we did. She said you didn't uh, do an accurate measurement of your results. We certainly did, including all of the data, except we did not include a statistic that she thought was important, which was a comparison of the means. Okay. If you look at our study, there's no need to do a comparison of the means when you have data four times larger in one category than in the other category. Okay. Mr. Lewinsky, yesterday you got to explain everything you wanted to about that, but now this is my time to ask you questions, so if you could just answer my question rather than providing an explanation, I'd appreciate it. So let me go back and ask my two questions. She criticized you for not having hypothesis testing, did she not, sir? Uh, yes, she did, inaccurately, but yes, she did. Um, got to put that last part in. She criticized you for uh, having inadequate measurement of results, didn't she, sir? Uh, and we know that was wrong, but yes, she did. And she criticized you for not establishing a control group, didn't she? Uh, which she didn't use herself. That's correct. Let me ask it again. She criticized you for not using a control group, didn't she? Yes, sir. Ask and answer. 
and she criticized you for uh, having uh, problems with internal and external validity and reliability, did she not? Uh, yes, she did, again, because of the problems we discussed. Um, and she criticized you because you did not ensure that you had eliminated the possibility of confirmation bias. I, I need to look at that. I, I don't remember uh, okay. her criticizing that. Um, you, you know that you cannot base uh, your conclusions on logic alone without empirical data based on good research practices and appropriate analysis, don't you? Uh, that's correct. Uh, Dr. Fournier's um, conclusion in her affidavits that she filed in those two cases and now has given us an affidavit in this case is that what you are doing is something called pseudoscience. Isn't that, wasn't that her conclusion, sir? Uh, she certainly used that word to my knowledge, uh, but that's... I, I question her judgment. So, so do other peer reviewers. Well, I, 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 that's clear, sir. That's what yeah. she said, is that she thought what you were doing was pseudoscience. Is that yeah, right? That's correct. That's an and yeah. pseudoscience, in lay terms, is another word for junk science. Is that right? Um, yes, in the extent that, um, yeah, she's criticizing one of our studies. That's correct. Okay. Until about a year or two ago, none of your projects had been peer reviewed in publications read by other psychologists, had they? Uh, I need, need to look at the data of our publications, and I don't know what psychologists read. Certainly, um, I think about three or four years ago, I was invited to the uh, police psychological services section uh, to present our research to them. So I presume they're reading our articles uh, and they're reading our research. So I, I don't know I can say yes or no to them. Okay, let me talk to you about a little bit about the idea of peer review. Um, uh, the idea of peer review is that you publish this in a place where um, people who may not support your point of view might review it as well as people who might support your point of view. Is that right? Uh, peer reviewed is simply reviewed by peers. Whether or not they support your point of view or not is is not relevant. They uh, evaluate the quality of the product that you do. Research design, testing hypothesis, correct statistics used in the, in the study. Um, the idea from a legal standpoint is that the article is out there and given a chance to be criticized to, for, by people who may not agree with your viewpoint. Is that right? Uh, I don't know that peer review does that. Uh, peer review evaluates the quality of your research, not whether or not people agree with you. Okay, let me do it the, the reverse way. You understand that if, like the tobacco experts, you just publish your research in a tobacco-friendly publication, the Tobacco Growers Magazine, that nobody's going to complain about that. They're going to be delighted about your research, and nobody is going to write a critical review of you. Is that right? I, I don't know about that. All right. But most of your projects have been published in police-friendly magazines rather than scientific journals. Is that fair to say? Uh, no. We have a couple of police magazine publications that Fournier has used to review as if they're research articles. Most of our research is published in peer-reviewed journals, and the review is done on procedure and methodology, not on whether or not they agree with you. Now, Mr. Lewinsky, did I mention Ms. Fournier at all in my question? I'm responding to your question about uh, publications being published in friendly publications. Yes, sir. Did you remember what my question is, or shall I repeat it for you? Why don't you repeat it? Okay. Uh, most, of your, most of your projects have been published in police-friendly magazines. Isn't that right, sir? That's wrong. Uh, many of your articles have been published in a magazine called The Police Marksman. We have two public, maybe three publications in The Police Marksman. Okay. That you would say is a police-friendly magazine, is it not? Um, it's, it's not in publication now, but it certainly was at the time. Uh, we publish in a, in a number of police magazines. Yes, that's true. And at the time that your articles were published in The Police Marksman, you were actually a, an associate editor of The Police Ar Marksman, were you not? Uh, that's correct. And then you have yesterday listed a whole bunch of your articles that have been public, published in the Law Enforcement Executive Forum um, magazine. Journal. I'm sorry, journal. Um, that is a uh, police-friendly magazine as well. Is that right, sir? It's meant for a police audience. 
uh, the reviewers review the quality of the work, not whether or not it's police friendly. It could be objective and anti-police policy, as long as the research design and quality of the research approve, is approved by the reviewers. And at the time that your articles were published in the Law Enforcement Executive Forum, uh, excuse me, journal, um, you were an executive, uh, an associate editor for that magazine as well, is that right? I, I am an editor, right, and right. the process is blind. Okay. Uh, reputable scientific journals have an impact score for peer review, do they not? Yes, they do. And the Police Marksman and the LEEF journal do not have a impact score for peer review, do they? Uh, I don't know what their, their score is. Um, Dr. Fournier's affidavit says all but one of your projects have not been peer reviewed. Uh, isn't that right, sir? Uh, that's because she's reading the Police Marksman and her newsline. And she said uh, yeah. that the one article that she didn't have a problem with is the one that you've brought up to the court yesterday. That is the article, and I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot which journal it was published in. The, it, was a, it was a psychology journal, is that right? I have no idea what you're referring to. Okay, I thought yesterday you said one of your articles was published in the premier psychological journal, and, and tell me what the name of the journal is. I'm sorry, I well, forgot. Well, actually, we have multiple publications in premier psychological journals, but the one that she reviewed a newsline on and looked at a video done by the Canadian Discovery Channel is one that we called our exhaustion study and it was published in Psychological Science Journal. Yes, sir, I'm asking about the one that you spoke about yesterday. Uh, that's the one that she was, that she, she criticized that I spoke about yesterday. Psychological Science Journal is the highest rated journal in psychology. Okay. Based on her review of a 1,500 word, uh, approximately 1,500 word newsline article in which we published only the summaries and some implications, uh, and she reviewed a video of the Canadian Discovery Channel. She said our thesis was uh, not founded, our research design was bad. I don't know how you could determine that off a, a newsline and a video production. I have questions about Dr. Fournier's ethics. Yes, sir, I think she probably has questions about your ethics as well. Sir. I'm sure we disagree. Yep. Um, and I didn't ask about Dr. Fournier again, sir. I know you want to talk about her, but the, the question I want to ask you is, uh, her criticism of that, uh, the, the, the one article she said that she thought was valid that may have had valid research was that article that was published in that magazine. And, and her comment in her, in her affidavit was that that was an article that, that she thought you didn't have much to do with because your name is listed at the very end of all the authors of that article. Uh, you're incorrect because you're referring to another article uh, in which she looked at a, uh, a submission to the Law Enforcement Executive Forum, and that was in our command study, which we talked about yesterday, done by Dr. Houlihan and police psycholo or psychology students of his, which we then gave major authorship to. Let's talk we designed that study. Okay, let's talk about how you got into the expert witness business, okay? Okay. Um, you wrote an article in November, December of 2000 in the Police Marksman magazine about how um, you could explain why police officers shot people in the back. Is that right? Well, I don't know that explain necessarily is true. We, we examined how that occurs within the dynamics of an encounter. Yes, sir. And this is the magazine that that was published in? Uh, that's correct. That's a magazine article. And that was when you were an associate editor on that, the board of that magazine, is that right? Yeah, simply magazine, yes. And, and the, the name of the article was, Why is the Suspect Shot in the Back? Isn't that right? That's correct. Um, and uh, you had, uh, that study was done with 25 undergrads in the law enforcement program at your university? That's correct. And one of the things you had them do, these are all fit, fit men and women, or was it all men? Uh, it was all men. All right. Had them turn around as fast as they could to see how fast they could turn their back. Is that right? Uh, no. We actually examined a multiple action and reaction dynamics, some of which involve pointing and shooting and turning and running. Forty percent of officer involved shootings involve someone running away and pointing back and shooting, actually attacking an officer as they're running away. So there's no need to explain why they're shot in the back then, but, but we did look at turning as part of a phenomenon. Um, and then you videotaped them turning as fast, as fast as they could or running as fast as they could? Uh, we looked at an average population and tested that 
That study was designed uh, with Dr. Roger Inoka at the University of Colorado Boulder. So it met uh, criterion for uh, the type of study we were doing. Do you, do you remember my question? Yes. You videotape people, ask them to turn around as fast as they could, and you videotape them? Uh, we asked them to do certain motions, which involved turning. Okay. You understand throughout the history of the West that shooting someone in the back was considered a cowardly act. Um, yeah, except if you watch my Cowboy Heroes, The Lone Ranger, they shoot people in the back or riding away and shooting back at them. So, and, you know, it's, it's really, I understand that, but there are differences as to how the shot gets there. Okay, my question just was, are you aware that in the West that it's thought to shoot somebody in the back uh, is a cowardly act? Objection, relevance, sustained. Um, after that article came out, you became the go-to police expert in every shooting where a police officer shot a citizen in the back even if they'd shot them multiple times. Is that right, sir? Uh, I, don't know, uh, I don't know that to be true. I've been asked to testify in cases in which that has occurred. Yes, all around the country. Go-to expert is uh, interesting. My, my uh, testimony doesn't reflect that I testify in every case where that happens. Okay, but you've gone all around the country um, testifying in situations where the police have shot people in the back, including where they've shot people in the back multiple times. Is that right? Um, that has occurred sometimes, okay. yes. And you've also branched out since that time and have been called to testify when officers have shot unarmed citizens. Uh, sometimes that has occurred, yes. Um, and you always testify for the officer when they've shot an unarmed citizen. Is that right? Um, I testify uh, for the officer. I don't necessarily, in fact, I don't justify that. I testify about the human performance dynamics from our research. And you testified in the San Francisco BART case about an officer who was sitting on someone's back. Um, some say that he, the, the subject was handcuffed. I think your version is that he had only one handcuff on, and the officer pulled out his gun and shot the man right in the back on videotape. Is that right, sir? Uh, those facts are incorrect. Um, which ones? Uh, actually, several. OK. Um, that's. You recognize that as the BART case, sir? I recognize the BART case. The facts you're presenting are inaccurate. Um, what, uh, you also have testified when a police officer broke an elderly woman's arm, haven't you, sir? Um, I did not testify as an expert in, in that case uh, regarding the breakage of the arm. In fact, I uh, told the attorney I was not an expert on that. He pushed, and the judge said, you asked for it. I told him I was not an expert on arm breakage. I would testify to what I taught in subject control techniques. You um, are used not just in civil cases, but in criminal cases. Yes, I, I testified to that yesterday. And recently, uh, as there have been more prosecutions of police officers for um, misconduct or excessive force or homicide, uh, you've been brought in by prosecutors into the secret grand jury to explain to grand jurors how things happened. Isn't that right? I've been asked to present our research to grand juries, coroner's inquests. Uh, that is correct. And in those grand secret grand juries and coroner's inquests, nobody challenges your qualifications to give your opinions, do they, uh, sir? Coroner's inquests are not secret. In fact, my understanding is that the coroner's inquests I testified to in the United Kingdom and in the United States have been pretty public forums. Let me break it into two different segments. In the secret grand jury, nobody qu challenges your qualifications to give those opinions, do they, sir? Uh, no, we're often asked to present it, but there's no challenges. Okay. Um, uh, you're aware that um, uh, in this New York Times article, both the Department of Justice and the Police Executive Research Forum were contacted um, and are concerned about how you are teaching uh, police officers to shoot first and you'll come in and provide the questions later. Isn't that right, sir? Uh, that was uh, information provided by John Burton. Okay, and the PERF director, Chuck Wexler, said he is troubled by your teachings. Is that not right, sir? I don't know what Chuck Wexler knows about our teachings, but we certainly do not teach what the title alleges. In fact, I was on CNN several nights ago saying that is not what we teach. And you went on CNN to rebut the New York Times article, sir? Is that right? I was, I was asked, yes. Excuse me just a second. Um, 
since you've had training in psychology, you understand the psychological phenomena of something called confirmation bias, do you not, sir? I certainly do. In psychology and cognitive science, confirmation bias is a tendency to search for or interpret information in a way that cons confirms one's preconceptions and often leads to scientific or statistical errors. Isn't that right, sir? Confirmation bias is a human phenomenon, and you're speaking about it when it occurs in a research process. Yes, sir, I am. Yes. Um, and yesterday you said to this court that you have no bias in favor of police officers. Is that right? That is correct. Um, you admit that since 2003 you have only testified on the side of police officers in criminal cases. Uh, excuse me, I need to clarify. I testify that I have no bias uh, in officers who are charged. Oh, all right. Do you have bias in favor of police officers? We certainly support the police profession and our research is designed to help them perform more effectively, right, in both training and investigations. Okay, so you do have a bias in favor of police officers? We certainly, uh, yes, perform our work primarily for the benefit of police uh, as, as a whole and the investigative bodies concerned with them. Okay, and, and that, now let's go back to my question. Since 2003, you have only testified in favor of police officers, whether it's a criminal case, in a secret grand jury proceeding, or in civil cases. Is that right? Uh, we have only been asked by police officers except for five cases in which plaintiffs have asked us, in which case I've testified once, wrote a report once in a plaintiff's case, and I've testified once uh, in a criminal case involving a police officer. Uh, that was before 2003, is that right? Uh, th that's correct, but that's all we've been asked. I mean, I, Let me I don't push you. myself. People ask us, police ask us to come and explain our research. Okay, that was your explanation. Now can we go back to my question. Since 2003, you have only testified on the side of police officers in criminal cases at secret grand juries and in civil cases. Uh, we've been asked to present our research to police or for police officers, yes. You have true. never testified on behalf of a citizen who was shot, killed, or injured by the police since, since 2003, have you? Uh, we've never been asked. Yes, sir. So, so the answer is no. Um, is it true that you don't believe that naive civilians should be allowed to judge the actions of officers? I, I believe that police officer training is highly professional, very complex, and uh, naive civilians need information if they're going to judge a professional activity. It doesn't matter what activity that is, whether it's medicine, law, engineering, it's very helpful for people to have some foundational information before they make a judgment. So I believe that naive citizens need training. Even though experts are supposed to approach each case from a neutral perspective, you think of yourself as part of the defense team defending the officer, do you not, sir? We're certainly part of bringing information forward if we're asked as part of a defense, yes. Yes, sir, but you think of yourself as part of the defense team, don't you? If we're asked, yes, that's, that's part of what we do. Um, and in fact, in your Force Sciences newsletter, um, even when if somebody disagrees with you, for example, in the BART case, you testified, but the officer was convicted anyway. Is that right? Uh, right, on a reduced charge, yes. And you continue to write about how the jury got it wrong. Is that right? I continue to speak about the human performance aspects of that, yes. Um, and criticize the jury in the court system for having uh, convicted that officer. The, uh, we speak about the judgment that the officer make and the human error and the fact that the court may not have understood the value of that, yes. Okay. In another case, Anthony Dwayne Lee, which was a Hollywood actor who was shot to death through a window several times in the back when he was at a Halloween party where he was carrying a fake gun as part of his costume, uh, you're aware that case ultimately settled, sir? Yes. And despite the fact that that case settled, um, you continue to teach that class as an example of a justified shooting that you say unfairly tarnished a good officer who was shooting to save his own life. Isn't that right, sir? Uh, I've never used that phrase. I've used it as an illustration of human performance dynamics. Um, the duration of shooting time, uh, position, uh, time for judgment issues. It's an excellent teaching example uh, for investigations. So, and we never say whether or not that shooting was justified. 
Uh, let's talk about inattentional blindness. Are you going to try to talk about that in this court today? Uh, no, focused attention, uh, certainly, but not inattentional blindness. Um, you're aware that Arian Mack, one of the two psychologists who coined the term inattentional blindness, says it is not appropriate to use that uh, term in court. Is that right? Uh, she said that, but she also said uh, because officers lie. Right. And, so and, and, and in the lab, in the lab, you understand there is no, mo no, no motivation to lie, is there? Uh, based on Arian Mack's observations, it's inapplicable in any situation involving humans where whatever they say is questionable. So therefore, you can't take it out of the lab if we restrict it only to Arian Mack's definition. You also need to look at what Arian Mack was referring to when she said that. I don't know what was posited to her. I do know in further conversations, we understand she did not understand what we are speaking about here in court today. Everyone else is wrong, and you are correct, sir. Is that right? Uh, no, no, no. I, I'm only saying when you consider what she says, you need to listen to the question that was posed and to how she was answering it and what concept she had in mind when she was answering it. Yes, sir. She, you aren't challenging her qualifications as a psychologist. Oh, no, no. I'm only, I'm only saying we should confirm the question that was asked of her when we look at her answer. Um, you acknowledge that you have no clear way to distinguish inattentional blindness from lying, do you, sir? Uh, that is correct. You are not a mind reader, are you, sir? Uh, correct. And you don't know what an officer is thinking other than what they tell you? Uh, that, is, that is correct. If an officer is speaking, we have other ways of looking at that uh, at this point in time. Uh, some objective measurements. We have ways of interviewing officers at this point in time that facilitates uh, uh, an understanding of the clarity and whether or not deception is involved. Uh, but it's absolutely, uh, you're correct in that. You can't say what the officer really saw or really knew at the time they pulled the trigger, can you, sir? Uh, that's, that's correct. Okay. And, and this whole idea of what the officer knows is complicated by the fact that you advise police investigators not to interview police officers for a few days until they have a time to calm down and think about what happened. Isn't that right, sir? We're following the recommendations of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Yes, sir. That's what you advise investigators to do, is to let the police officers calm down for a couple of days. Is that right? That's what the professionals and the experts in law also uh, state. So we're, we're endorsing what they state. Okay. And you, in that, you are proposing that they treat police officers involved in a homicide differently than ordinary citizens involved in a homicide. Is that right? Uh, actually, they're treating them the same. Uh, citizens can invoke Miranda and never have to say anything at any time. Uh, so they can, if they want to compose themselves, they certainly can take a few days before they, uh, they say anything, if they say anything at all. Yes, sir. Do you advise police officers that they should tell citizens, uh, whether they invoke Miranda or not, that really you should go home for a couple days and I'll interview you in a couple days? Uh, that certainly is a citizen's choice. By the way, it's what we tell uh, victims of assault all the time. Yes, sir. So do, do you advise and train police officers that they should not interview uh, witnesses or suspects at a homicide scene until a couple days? Do, is that what you advise investigators? I have never advised investigators on when to interview civilian witnesses, uh, especially if they invoke Miranda. Okay. And in fact, online, where any police officer can access it, you have put all these articles, including articles like 10 Tips for Surviving Controversial High-Profile Cases. Yes, we're reporting on information provided by others we think might be helpful for the profession. Yes, sir. and in the two days that the police officer is calming down and waiting for an interview, nothing prevents them from getting online on your website to find your advice and all the articles about things like inattentional blindness, does it, sir? Oh, I, I have uh, no idea what they might do, but that certainly could be true. Um, and they could read that if they claim they didn't see the, that the person's back was to them, that you may come in and defend them on that basis. Is that right? There's all sorts of things you could allege uh, that may occur. I, I don't know. Um, and you recommend that the police officers who are involved in a homicide review the videotape, do a scene walkthrough, and consult with their peers who were involved before they ever give a statement. Isn't that what you tell police officers? Uh, that is what we tell police officers if you're looking for the most accurate uh, 
uh, report possible on the true objective information about what occurred. When we look at the research that supports accurate reporting, conferring supports accurate reporting if you can eliminate bias. Uh, it, memory aids such as walking through a scene, looking at video, are things that are currently used in the police practice to enhance memory. And, and they objectively enhance memory. They have problems, but they certainly objectively enhance memory. So if you want the best report possible, uh, you certainly could do that. Okay, and that, if, that was, if this were a regular citizen or a suspect in a homicide doing that exact thing, going back to the scene and doing a scene walkthrough and looking at all the evidence and talking to all their buddies, you would say that they were getting their false story straight, wouldn't you, sir? Well, certainly every citizen can do that. Yeah. Um, do you know if uh, Officer Pettis followed your advice to review the videotape, go to the scene, and talk to other officers before he ever gave his statement? I have no idea. You know, if yeah, you by the way, we, we, we also state that most uh, citizens, judges, courts would not uh, endorse conferring. In fact, the state of California, it's specifically forbidden, and in most states uh, is. It's just a way of affirming information, and officers do it in most cases in which they're laying charges. Yeah. Do so, you know if he got online to see any of your articles about how to defend himself from these kind of charges? I don't have any idea. Um, on the issue of bias against her, your whole business model revolves around three prongs involving uh, police officers. Uh, one, you testify as an expert, is that right? About 10% of the time now, yes, or less, actually less. And when you testify, your typical rate is to charge $950 an hour for testimony and $400 an hour for review. Uh, it may be higher than that now. Th those are older. Uh, but if I'm, if I'm going to do testimony, um, yes, we're very busy, and that's the amount of money we believe we should charge for my time. And um, the other prong is that you train investigators who investigate police shootings. Is that right? Uh, yes. We and our staff, including physicians and other professors, uh, bringing the latest research on human behavior to investigations, that's and, correct. And then you also train officers themselves about what they should say or do if they're in a shooting, is that right? No. Well, don't you put articles out about that very thing, sir? What officers should say and do? Yes, sir. Um, After they're involved in a shooting. We may have attorneys uh, or other experts uh, say something. We do not uh, make statements about that. Uh, directly from four signs. Okay, and all of that uh, income that is derived from your training comes through the Four Science Institute, does it not? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I missed some words on that. The money that you get from training police officers and training investigators of police shootings goes into the Four Science Institute? Uh, yes, that's correct. That fuels the, uh, the company. And you can't say how much your company is made off of that kind of training, other, at least you couldn't say when we asked you, other than to say it's more than a million dollars a year. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. Last income tax, uh, it was a little over that. And in all the depositions, we reviewed your very vague on how much money you're actually making. And of course, that's a relevant thing for us to know what your bias is. And so what I'd like to do, sir, is subpoena you here in court, since you're here in New Mexico, uh, to provide us with that information in a tax return if you continue to be an expert in this case. Um, if I can have a moment, Your Honor. Um, state this was your motion, or you were, you had a challenge. I, I'm assuming you are moving to exclude him. I'm moving to exclude him completely, Judge. And, and I want to make the argument that, I don't know if you are a John Stewart fan. He signed off last night. And I didn't see it last night because I was getting ready for trial, but I saw it this morning. And his sign-off was, was, and I will say it less colorfully than John Stewart said, um, there is BS out there is what he said, but he used the real words. And he said, when you smell it, you need to call somebody on it. And, and that's what this is. This, this man uh, is part of the problem and not part of the solution for police officers. He is going around training officers to shoot first, and he'll come in and defend their conduct, that it's OK to shoot people in the back. It's OK to shoot unarmed people. Um, and then is also training investigators to let them have a couple days so they can get online and look up his stuff to figure out what you say to defend yourself in a proceeding. And um, he has never been qualified. And I understand he's been led into a lot of courts, but a lot of the criminal cases he's testified in, Judge, too, are, are uh, secret grand jury proceedings. He's brought in uh, um, to sort of whitewash when a police shoots somebody to come in and explain in a secret grand jury, let me tell you about um, how this shooting was justified based on my research about why they shot him in the back, and then it comes out of the grand jury and no, no 
police officer is indicted as a result of his testimony, and no one gets to see what he's doing. And he's been doing it in secret in his criminal cases for a while now. Um, this man should not should be stopped here in New Mexico. He is not qualified by training. This this whole idea that there is a there is nowhere in the world other than at his university and his program a police psychology degree that does not involve uh, clinical psychology. All the other police psychologists and the degrees for police psychology are for giving clinical training to police officers. Uh, finally, in New Mexico, we've got a rule. You can't come in here and say you're a psychologist unless you're licensed somewhere. He's licensed nowhere. He's licensed nowhere. And even though he's giving opinions on these studies, he's holding himself out as a police psychologist here. And I think it is wrong to allow him to testify based on education, which I think is deficient, um, and, and based on the self-serving research that he has done over and over again um, that does not have scientific standards that he complies with and much, much worse, has this whole issue of confirmation bias. He, it is obvious he is uh, biased in favor of the police just by the fact that most of his publications and most of the ones that Mr. Robles went over except for one or two yesterday are all published in police magazines. And that, that's not peer review. This is exactly like uh, the experts that the tobacco industry developed to come in and say smoking doesn't cause cancer. This is exactly the same thing, Judge. And he's been going around the country doing the same thing, and I would ask the court to stop him here. If the court is not willing to, and I also, but on the flip side, Judge, I also understand this is a preliminary hearing, and I understand the court can listen to evidence and, and disregard what it thinks is not believable. Um, and if you are concerned about an appellate issue, I also understand that if you allow him to testify, um, just to get through the prelim, um, my request would be that you limit him very strictly just to reaction time and his research on reaction time and none of this hogwash about um, uh, attention span or the police officer can't remember what happened or what he's focused on, that all of that is just hogwash as indicated by the psychologist who came up with the term inattentional blindness says you just cannot use it um, in, a, in, in, the, in a real life setting or in a courtroom because it just is invalid because you can't tell whether the police officer really didn't see it or is just saying he didn't see it. Um, so that's my argument, Judge. Thanks.